What a blessing God has provided for us this morning. Uh, Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. We're studying today the second beatitude in the book of Revelation in the 14th chapter of Paul's vision of Revelation, the 14th chapter, the 13th verse. Now, you remember a couple of weeks ago when I preached on the first beatitude, we talked about the, um, the number seven and how significant that number is. It's used 52 times in the book of Revelation alone. And there are seven Beatitudes recorded in John's letter to the churches in Revelation. Uh, That Monday, Paul sent me a text and said, Did you know that the word blessed has seven letters in it? Well, I I didn't even think to count the number of letters in the word blessed. And sure enough, there they are. Now think about that just for a minute. A word that has seven letters where in the book of Revelation the number seven is represented as God's number in seven beatitudes. I mean, there's got to be something special about these beatitudes, wouldn't you think? That's just not by chance. Uh, That is the... I mean, you learn things like that in Sunday school, (laughs) you know? how special these Beatitudes are. And in order to really appreciate and understand what God says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, you have to look at at chapter 13. You have to understand what is happening before you get to Revelation chapter 14. Our text this morning from the 13th verse in the 14th chapter of Revelation is this, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. All right? Now let's turn over to chapter 13, because I just want you to see the setting there. It's very important to understand that in chapter 13, John paints us a picture. He paints us a picture of what is happening upon the earth at the time of the book of Revelation. And what he says there, uh, he saw in a great vision a beast rising out of the sea. Actually, there are two beasts that are rising, one out of the sea and one out of the earth. And the job of these two beasts is to slander, put down, and defeat the people of God. To war against the church. Look at Revelation 13, 6 through 8. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Now, I think we can all agree that there's something going on in the world that is not in keeping with the Word of God and the things of God, right? There is a war taking place. There is a conflict, a struggle that is happening not only in the book of Revelation, but every day in our lives and all around us. And the Bible gives evidence of that and calls it a beast. You ever, you ever feel like you, you're wrestling with a, a, a big old something or other? <laughs> you know? 
And sometimes he gets the best of you, wears you down, those kinds of things. That's what he's talking about here. Listen to what 1 Thessalonians says. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 8. My mama always told me when I was a teenager growing up, she said, there's nothing good happens after 12 o'clock. Right? Be in before 12 o'clock. Because that is the realm of the beast. Be careful in the night. That's where the beast reigns supreme. Robbie and I have been talking about this. You know, we're, we're noticing that many of our young people who have been faithful and have been uh, regular in their attendance to our youth events have taken on jobs. And uh, they are working now. And it's difficult for them to be at some of the events that we try to do for our young people. They are taking on responsibility. They have driver's license and they have insurance and they have things that are required for them and they don't want to be overburdened on their parents so they take jobs, but it keeps them away from us here at the church as regular as they used to be. Right? These are not bad kids. They're not doing anything wrong. They're good kids. They're responsible kids. Young people, I should say. Students. They're being responsible in their lives, taking on opportunities in the workplace. But I want you to see it's nobody's fault, but the culture itself works against us. The minute they go out from us into the world assume these responsibilities and take them on, they go into, listen to me, the world of the beast. And we better make sure that they've been in Sunday school and have deep roots planted in their heart. Deep roots of the Word of God. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the beast who confronts us all the time. Listen, you don't have to be captured by Al-Qaeda and have your head chopped off for professing Christ. You don't have to be dragged into court like they are. God is not dead too. You don't have to defend yourself. All you've got to do is wake up in the morning. Get out of your house, get out of, and go into the workplace, go into the world to have contact and be confronted by the power and the realm of evil. All right? It's all around us. Now that is the context for which we turn to chapter 14. Listen, I feel a whole lot better about chapter 14 than I do chapter 13. All right? Bad stuff happens in chapter 13. Good stuff happens in chapter 14. Look what it says here in chapter 14. And I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name, the name of his Father, written on their foreheads. I don't have time to go into this morning and preach to you about the Lamb. Oh, I wish I did. If we had Sunday night services, I'd tell you all about the Lamb. Suffice it to say, John the Baptist knew who Jesus was. You remember what he said at the baptism of Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And in this vision, this place where, where um, uh, John is seeing, he sees the Lamb in victory, high and lifted up. I like that. Right? I want to talk to you a little bit more in detail about the place itself. The place where they are, Zion. Zion is a reference 
to the place where Jesus is. Zion is the fortress of the city called Jerusalem. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says about this place called Zion. But you have come to Mount Zion. Who's he talking to? He's talking to you and me. Uh, this place is prepared for us. It's a high place. It's lifted up. It's Mount Zion. And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. Listen, we're going to be in good company up there. To myriads of angels and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. You know your name's going to be written down. you got a place. You're enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to, and to, and to, he just keeps on going, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Now think about that just for a moment. This cross-reference from the book of Hebrews tells us where we're going to be. We're going to be exalted together with the Lamb, you know why I love the mountains? I love the mountains. Listen, when I leave this earth, I'm headed uphill. For all of you who uh, like the beach, uh, how many of you are getting ready to go to the beach? Uh, we've got some folks that are there this week. I just want, before you go to the beach, I want you to turn to Chapter 13, verse 1. Let's look what it says there. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. There's a contrast here. The mountains and the seashore. Now what happens when you build your house on sand? You remember what Jesus said? The winds blow. The rains fall. The floods come. And great is the fall, right? Of the house that is built on the sand. I, I worry about you folks that love the beach. It's okay to visit the beach, but don't build your house on it. Shifting sand. That's the realm of the beast. You see the contrast? The sand, the shifting, undetermined and unpredictable uh, sand is the place where the beast has his heyday. He works best in that environment. But up here is where the people of God are. You, are, you and me have built our house on the rock and we stand triumphantly with the Lamb there in the mount called Zion. Got the picture? Now I, I want to say three things in five minutes about what it means to build your house upon the rock and to stand together with Jesus on Mount Zion. Listen, I studied this thing all week. The Bible says, blessed are the dead. Well, you don't have to die to get your blessing. You know that? Your blessing starts now. This beatitude begins here in this life. When one of these little children comes forward in vacation Bible school and professes Christ as their Savior, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They are heaven bound at that point. You know? It's not about how much money you have. It's not about your position. It's not about your place in the culture. Matter of fact, the culture works against the things of God. It's about who you know. It's about Jesus who is in your heart. Look what it says. It says right in the verse 13 of chapter 14. Blessed are the dead. You remember two weeks ago when I talked to you about being blessed? Blessed are the dead. I used the word makaroi. 
Sounds like macaroni, doesn't it? I almost said that, by the way. <laughs> McElroy. This is a declaration of God. It's not about how you feel. It's not about your backache. It's not about uh, whether you feel good or positive. It is a declaration of God upon those who have trusted in Christ. Look at what John t- says in Chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. Now judgment is upon this world. Not he. Ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. You know, what, you know what this blessed me, this word blessed means in this context? It means that you live in this world of conflict and toil and struggle and pain, but you look up there and you see where you're headed. You don't let your living here determine what you're looking for up there, right? I heard about a rabbi. Someone visited this rabbi in Poland before the Second World War. And uh, when they went into the rabbi's house, they were astounded to see that there was only a single chair in the whole house. And there was a table, and there were several books stacked on the table, and that was it. And so the, so the visitor said to the rabbi, said, um, Where's your furniture? Don't you have any furniture? And uh, the rabbi looked at him and said, Well, where's your furniture? And the man said, Well, I'm just a visitor. I'm just passing through. And I've been invited to come to your house and, and share with you, but I'm not going to stay here. And then the rabbi said to his visitor, So am I. You know? Isn't it a blessing? You know, I moved my my oldest son this week. I helped to move my oldest son. We moved from Jefferson to Hall County, North Hall. We packed up three, not just one, but three 20-foot moving vans. Three of them. He sold his house over in Jefferson. And he moved to, um, uh, to North Hall. And in the process of that, he only had two refrigerators. When he lived in Jefferson, you know how many he's got now? He's got three refrigerators. Three. You know? The fact of the matter is, is that we accumulate, we take on like this is our home. Like this is, you know, this is the place where we live, but it's not our own. This is a place where we hang out, we make our living, we raise our children, but our home is someplace else. I mean, uh, compare, uh, how long are you going to live? About 75 years, unless you live in Russia. Robbie and I traveled there, the average lifespan in Russia is 60 years old. We were the oldest people in the bus. You know, people actually got up out of their seats and gave us their seats <laughs> because you don't see old people on the streets. I mean, old people like us. You know? I mean, my goodness, think about 60 plus years. What, what is it? Uh, four score and ten? Think about 60 plus years compared to eternity. That's what blessed is. It's knowing where you're going. It's having the assurance of heaven in your life. I want to ask you this morning, do you know which side of the fence you're on? Are are you on the chapter 13 side? You know what happens down there. You know the beast, uh, the shifting sand and all of that. Are you on the beast side or are you on the side of the lamb? I want, to, I want to tell you, if you're not on the side of the Lamb, if you don't know where you're going this morning, uh, come talk to me during the invitation time. I'll help you. 
I'll pray with you. And you can settle that point today where you're headed. Uh, he also tells us that they rest from their labors. Uh, Do you get a lot of rest this week? You know, Americans are the most unrested people in the world. Really, did you know that seven people die in this country of stress-related circumstances every two seconds? Every two seconds. We are overworked. Uh, we are filled with stress. And even when we get a little rest, we feel guilty about it. Now for all of you people, like me, like your pastor, who has to take hypertension medicine, that's high blood pressure medicine, medications, you know? For all of you people that have those prescriptions, listen to what he says here. So that they may rest from their labors. You know what the word labor means in this context? The word labor means work that leads to fatigue. You ever get tired? You ever get burdened? Sure. He's speaking right to our hearts right here. I mean, think about these people in the New Testament church. They're just like we are. Uh, they were uh, beat down. Uh, there was a beast at work trying to defeat them every day and steal and rob away the essence of their faith in their lives. They, they were like we are. They, they, they were heavy laden. You know what Jesus said? Listen, Jesus said, I'll give you rest. Uh, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden. All you who labor. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly. And, and this is the best part. And ye shall find rest for your souls. I, I want to tell you if you, can't, if you can't be at peace and have rest in here, forget about it out there. Uh, Jesus concentrates on the in here. And He'll help you settle the question of sin in your life. He'll help you deal with that habit that confronts you and defeats you. He'll come into you and He will give you strength. And He will give you hope. He will clean you up if you'll just let Him. He's talking about the rest, the inner peace that comes from knowing Christ is what He's talking about here. Rest. I hope you just feel, right now, I just hope you feel the tension kind of easing down. Can you? You kind of feel inside the, the comfort and the rest of the Lord in your soul. A man challenged another man to an all-day wood chopping contest. And these two men went at it. One man chopped wood all day long. He only stopped one time for a short lunch break. And he just chopped and he chopped and he chopped. He sweated. He, he, uh, he lost his energy. He expended himself chopping wood, trying to defeat this guy who challenged him. The guy who was uh, working against him uh, took a long, leisurely lunch break kind of odd. And uh, this guy took a couple of three uh, shorter breaks during the day in order just to drink some water and refresh himself. And at the end of the day, the guy who had spent all of his energy working so hard was so upset to see that his challenger had more wood in his pile than he did. And he said, I don't get it. I worked harder than you did. I didn't, I didn't take time off, and every time I looked up, you were taking a minute off. How come you have more wood than I have? The other guy said, well, you just didn't notice that every, every break I took, I was sharpening my axe. 
You get it? I want to tell you, you be careful. You be careful about taking on the beast. Working hard. Working overtime. Listen, he's working as harder than you are. Right? Your axe needs to be sharp when you take him on. How do you sharpen your axe? You sharpen your axe by coming to church on the day of rest. You know God needed rest. He rested on the seventh day. He worked hard on six days, but he took the seventh day and rested. Do you know in Exodus chapter 20, he said, You shall have a Sabbath, and there'll be no work on that day. If God needs rest, how much more do I need rest? And what I need rest in doing on the Sabbath is sharpening my axe. Getting ready for the grind. Getting ready for that battle that's going to take place the next week so I can confront it in the power of God rather than my own energy and strength. So rest in the Lord. Get you a nap this afternoon. Okay. Rest in the Lord. Open this book. Spend a little time in it and sharpen your axe. They shall find rest. And then this next part may be the most important part of the whole Beatitude. Our works do follow us. Look what it says. For their deeds follow them. I preached this passage of scripture at my mother's funeral. Because I know right now there in her place and glory she's enjoying the rewards of her diligence. Her rewards over her study and her Care for the Word of God. You know, right up until she was 90 years old when she passed away, and she was telling people how to, how to go to heaven up until the day she died. There in the nursing home in her wheelchair, she had her Bible, and she would talk to people about Jesus all the time. I, I, look over at verse 6 here in chapter 14. Look what it says there. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an internal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. What's he talking about when he's talking about work? He's not talking about you making your living. He's talking about being faithful to tell people about Jesus. That's the work he's talking about. That'll do you a lifetime. I mean, telling folks about how to get to heaven. I heard of, I heard of a, a, a preacher friend of mine. He was witnessing one day to this old boy, and he said, Man, do you know Jesus? And the guy said, No, I don't know him. And he said, Well, I want to tell you about him because when I die, I'm going to heaven, and I want to take as many people with me as I can. That's what this parable is. That's what this beatitude is about. Our works follow us because we have the gospel and we have the privilege of sharing it with everybody we, we know. Have you shared the gospel this week? Have you told somebody how to get to heaven this week? I heard this story about this young farmer boy who had stopped in the street and all of his hay had fallen off his trailer and he was busy with this big old mound of hay. He was busy picking that hay up just one bale after another after another. This preacher was walking by and he said, hey, you look pretty hot. You look pretty spent. Why don't you just rest a minute and I'll help you when you get a little rest. And the boy said, no, I don't think I should. So my daddy would be upset if he knew I stopped. He just kept picking up. He didn't miss a lick. He picking up that hay. Well, the preacher said, surely your daddy will understand. He said, just take, take a cool drink of water and just rest here for a minute. You'll be much better after rest. The guy just didn't, he didn't even acknowledge what the preacher had said. He just kept, kept on at his job, picking up, picking up the hay. And then the preacher said, third time, said, my, your, your daddy must be a real slave driver. Said, I can't wait to give him a piece of my mind. Young boy said, well, as soon as I get this hay up, you can tell him whatever you want to because he's underneath the hay. (laughs) 
There's a lot of people underneath the hay. What if we were as urgent about telling people about Jesus as that soldier is going after his fallen comrade in the midst of a battle? What if we were as diligent in sharing our faith in the Lord Jesus as that emergency room is when we go in and our chest is beating and our heart is not functioning well and they send us into the urgent care area. I mean, telling people about Jesus is not something that's optional, is it? Or is it something that is urgent, that calls upon us to be diligent about? I don't know how the Lord may have spoken to you through this message today, but I am so thankful that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm part of this beatitude. I know where I'm going. Don't you? Man, if you don't know where you're going, you need to settle that this morning. I, I, I know. And, and, and I'm able to sit down with my Bible. I want to tell you, I can sit down with my Bible and the cares, the worries of this world just go away. And me and God have a time when I open this book and I read it and I study it and chew on it like the Bible says. And then the opportunity to share Christ with others is such a wonderful blessing. Our works do follow us. I want you to respond to this message as the Lord leads you. Yes, you feel at home and comfortable. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning. And you respond as the Lord leads you today. It's not about whether I preach good or not. It's about what God says to your heart and how He communicates with you. Will you respond to Him this morning? It might be that uh, you're a church member. And you've not been as diligent in sharing your faith with others that you need as you need to be. And you can come and make that commitment that God lays upon your heart to be, be urgently at work sharing your faith in Christ. Whatever need you have, let's stand to our feet and let the Lord lead us this morning.